we'll pray, if we'll seek his face, if we'll knock on heaven's door corporately, then God said he'll, he'll answer from heaven. And uh, so please think about coming out all three days or one of those days and let's join our hearts in earnest intercession and prayer for an awakening uh, that would happen in our region because we're responsible for our city. We're responsible for our region. You and I are. We're the church. We're the ones that are to push back the powers of the principalities and to create an open heaven to make it easy for people to know God and come to salvation. All right? So please, and uh, if you need a wake-up call, send me a text, and I'll be glad to wake you up at 3 in the morning. <laughs> Make sure you're going to be here by 530. All right. A couple other things. Uh, if you've not been water baptized, please get signed up. Don't put it off any longer. Don't delay your obedience. It has nothing to do with your comfort level. It has nothing to do with your... Uh, embarrassment it has everything to do with your obedience to God so just whatever excuse you've ever put in place for not getting water baptized this is the time to just crucify that thing and tell it you're not ruling over me God's words gonna rule over me and I'm gonna obey Jesus rather than my feelings or my reputation or whatever anyone else might think about me getting water baptized you get it done and watch what God will do can I get an amen all right finally one other thing you heard our, uh, that little kid, uh, Ben, man, he's good. He's like, he's good. He's got a natural gift there, you know, so if he, I'm his agent now, so if you need him for a commercial, uh, come see me. We can work out a deal. Uh, kids camps, uh, do not let the, the price, and I don't even know what it is, but if, uh, if you're a single mom, if you're grandparent with children or something and you just it's it's a hardship for you to maybe get all three or four if you need a partial scholarship or whatever do not let money stand in the way of your child getting ministered to these people that volunteer their time and we need volunteers by the way it takes like 150 or so people to help with food to help with counselors and all that uh, don't just assume that a church this size there'll be plenty of people that's not the case because people assume that's what happens. They assume that there'll be so many that I don't need to. And that's just, that's what everyone tends to think. And that's not the case. So uh, let God tug on your heart. And uh, if you do need a scholarship, feel free to, uh, don't be embarrassed. Uh, need a partial one, whatever. We want to make sure that happens. Okay? We all good? All right. Ready to get into the Word? Yes. All right. I am too. If you need a Bible, lift your hand. Ushers will be glad to share one. If you don't have a Bible... Please um, take one, keep it. We'd love for you to do that. And also consider taking one and giving it away. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful and thankful for your goodness, your love, your mercy. We thank you for the authority and the power of your word. It's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. God, we're not here to just be casual observers and uh, uh, casual hearers. God, we want to lean in to this time as an act of worship. We want our hearts to be totally open. We want our minds to be alert. We want to receive your word, mix it with faith. God, act upon it so it can bear fruit. That fruit can remain. It'll be evident in our lives a year from now, two years and 20 and 30 and 40 years from now. God, it would still be active in us because you do not want your word to return void. And you're worthy of a people, Lord, who are sold out to you and who bear fruit, so prove to be your disciples and glorify you. We pray for this grace to be upon us all, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and spoke, saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. Also, in time past, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, you shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. Therefore, all the leaders or all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. In all Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. 
And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David, saying, You shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will repel you, thinking, David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city, the city of David. Now David said on that day, Whoever climbs up the way of the water shaft and defeats the Jebusites, the lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Therefore they say, the blind and the lame shall not come into the, into the house. Then David dwelt in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built all around from Milo and inward. So David went on and became great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. You see, the enemy loves to set up, set up strongholds in our lives. What had happened was uh, the Jebusites had set up a stronghold in the city of God. And so it was being occupied by the enemy. The enemy loves to set up strongholds in our lives. We may be giving our life to Christ. We may have given our life over to God. But many times there are still strongholds that exist. Strongholds of unforgiveness. Strongholds of bitterness. Strongholds of... Uh, just brokenness, that want to remain, that don't want to budge. How many know what I'm talking about? Uh, uh, strongholds that, that, that come in to just take over. Uh, anger is a stronghold. Bitterness is a stronghold. Unforgiveness is a stronghold. Uh, shame is a stronghold. Regret is a stronghold. We could go on and on. There's generational strongholds that get in families. You know, alcoholism, divorce. We could go on and on about strongholds that need to be broken. The enemy is setting them up in the city of God. How many of you know that's not good? And they have to be conquered. Uh, see, the Jebusites were tough and mighty warriors. And their city was set on a high mountain and most likely was surrounded by a wall that seemed to be in, in, like, we can't get through this wall. But David wasn't going to settle for that. And David, looking at the city, saw a weakness. He, he saw a way to get in. And he challenged his, whoever will cra crawl up this viaduct, this gutter, as it were. Probably, probably all the stuff coming out of the city just flew out of it. I mean, it's going to be a dirty job. Um, whoever gets up there will surprise the enemy and will take this city. Now, David was taunted then by the Jebusites. Look, you'll never get in here. The lame and the blind can take you guys out. How I many know the enemy loves to taunt you? The enemy loves to threaten you. But David did discover their weakness. And they took the city. We're in a series entitled, Love Like You've Never Been Hurt. Love Like You've Never Been Hurt. And we're going to talk today in our last of this series, part number six, Keep Climbing. If you're going to love like you've never been hurt, you're going to have to keep climbing. And some of the things that you're going to have to climb are dirty gutter systems, <laughs> viaducts that, that you're going to have to climb up, that have all kinds of stuff coming out of them. And you're going to have to keep climbing if you're going to love like you've never been hurt. Let's look at three lessons that I want to share with you this morning from this passage of Scripture. Point number one, where you are is not your final destination. Where you are is not your final destination. Now David, you have to understand something historically here. David was anointed king at Hebron. But that was just for the tribe of Judah. At that time, the family was split. At that time, Israel and Judah were divided. They had a divided nation. And David could have settled in. David could have just said, hey, I'm good. Hebron's good. Elders like me. I like them. Everything's good. But he, he was destined for more. Destined, destined to reunite the family. Destined to be a reconciler. And so David wasn't settling in with us four and no more. 
David wasn't settling in with what wasn't God's purpose for his life. He knew he had a greater destiny. He heard the whisper of God in his heart. There is more for you, David. You're not, you're not to settle that this is going to be the way it is. So many people in a time and a season make permanent decisions for temporary situations. And so what was meant to be a season becomes a sentence. Like I'm sentenced to this because of decisions that were made in temporary seasons. It's never good to make those kind of decisions in a temporary situation. People quit because it gets too hot. You know, we just planted some pansies. Pansies do great in cold weather. They're called pansies because they can't stand the heat. <laughs> they, they, they can't bear up under the heat. They're pansies. You give them a little bit of heat and they wither. And you and I are destined to be more than just a beautiful pansy <laughs> that just flowers for a moment, but when the heat comes, we fade away. We're called to be more than conquerors through Christ who loves us and gave himself for us. And so David understood that he had a destiny. And see, God is calling you and God's calling me to a place greater than where we are. There's still, there are still people for you to reach. There are still lives for you to touch. There are still places my feet need to go to preach the gospel. Come on. We're not done. I don't know, even if you're in retirement, I'm going to tell you something. You're not done. You, you're not done. You're, you're not done being connected to the body of Christ. You're not done feeding life and feeding love and feeding support and encouragement and being part of something bigger than yourself. Amen. Your glory years are not just in rest and relaxation. Your glory years are in still being useful, still contributing, bringing your presence, bringing your counsel and your wisdom. Come on now. Amen. You're not done until your last breath is over and then you take your next breath in heaven. That's when you're done. Until then, where you are is not your final destination. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> See, the enemy uses psychological warfare to try to tell you you're done, to try to tell you you've finished. He, he'll try to say things like, you don't belong here. You're not powerful enough. You come from the lame and you come from the blind. Be content with what you have. Settle in Hebron. David, settle in Hebron. You don't have what you think you have. Your father was a drunk, and you'll be one too. This stronghold has been in your family for generations. There's no way you can beat it. See, that's the psychological warfare of the enemy, and you can't listen to it. You must fight and not settle. Look at 2 Corinthians 10. It says, I do live in the world, but I don't fight my battles the way the people of the world do. The weapons I fight with are not the weapons the world uses. In fact, it is just the opposite. My weapons have the power of God to destroy the camps of the enemy. I destroy every claim and every reason that keeps people from knowing God. I keep every thought under control in order to make it obey Christ. You see, the dirtiest battle will often be your greatest victory. Your dirtiest battle will often be your greatest victory. Through the power of the cross, you can take down strongholds, defeat the enemy, and be victorious. Point number two, listen to what God is saying. If you're going to keep climbing, if you're going to keep loving like you've never been hurt, I mean, you're really going to embrace this message and not just write it off as... Well, you know, that was a five or a four on the series that we've done, and it was okay. You're like, yeah, it's not as good as, you know, Crash the Chatterbox or Seeing Good Things or, you know, the one that Pastor Philip did and wrote. <laughs> like, you guys, what? He did? No. Well, I had ghost writers. All right. <laughs> Blame it on the ghost. All right. That's how memorable it was. 
See, that's not the purpose of this. The purpose of it is to embrace it, to live it, and let it become part of our life. Like, I really want to love. Like, when I got out of my car last night to come in here to, to preach and to worship, I said, Lord, here we go. Let's go love like we've never been hurt. Let's go love like we've never been hurt. Why? Because that's how God's loving me. God loves me like I've never hurt him. And he keeps loving me like I've never hurt him. And I know I have. I've broken my promises to him. I've disappointed him with my reactions and my actions. I've disappointed him in thought. I've disappointed him in word. I've disappointed him in deed. And guess what? He keeps loving me like I've never hurt him. And so this is a partnership with God. That he's inviting you to and calling you to as a Christian witness in the earth. Will you keep loving others like you've never been hurt. Like he keeps loving you like you've never hurt him. And so it's an assignment and I'm serious about it and I hope that you are too. You see, if you're going to keep on climbing though, you're going to have to listen to what God is saying. When in a fight for your destiny, do not let what you are seeing or the enemy is saying... Hinder what God wants you to hear. See, when you're in a fight with the enemy, he'll try to make you see things as hopeless. He'll try to make you hear things as if it's impossible. And you've got to not let that hinder you from what God is saying. John, John chapter 10 says this. When I'm about to tell you Pharisees is true. This is Jesus speaking. What if someone does not enter the sheep pen through the gate but climbs in another way? That person is a thief and a robber. The one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. The sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own sheep, he goes on ahead of them. His sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him. They don't recognize a stranger's voice. You've got to listen to the voice of God. I am like, it really bothers me when I hear people quoting to me what the devil's telling them. It, it bothers me. Because it's like, why are you even listening to him? You're a child of God. You just pray it. You just sing it. Is Jesus your shepherd? Yes, he is. Then I don't listen to the voice of a stranger. I could care less what the devil says. Do you, uh, you need a care less attitude. Like, I don't, I'm not listening to him. Why do I care what the devil says? I don't care. He's a liar. He twists everything. Why would I even want to give him an ounce of my attention? He's to be rebuked. He's to be resisted. And I do that through worship. I do that through prayer. I do that through the weapons of my warfare that are not carnal. But I just don't engage him in conversation. I don't listen to his voice. It's the voice of a stranger. That's not my wife's laugh. That's not my wife's voice. I know it. I've been around it for 40 years. 40. <laughs> Almost. I'm believing by faith. We're going into it. When we meet. 1980? You don't even remember. <laughs> we got married in 82, honey. We didn't get married the day we met. All right. See, I got to help her out. Amen. <laughs> I got to help her out. See, the things that women are supposed to remember. I love this story from the book. This is a great story. On a mid-October afternoon in 1982, 60,000 plus fans gathered to watch the University of Michigan Badgers football team take on the Michigan uh, State Spartans. The, ho the hometown team roared in anticipation for, for this game. Unfortunately, as, it began, as the game began to go longer and longer, uh, the score got worser and worser. <laughs> and, and the Badgers fell further and further behind but the, but the crowd kept roaring the, ke the crowd kept, kept shouting 
And, and the players and the coaches are like, what is going on? Like, what in the world? are Like, we're, we're getting killed, and these fans, are, they keep roaring. Well, here's the thing. They didn't know. They didn't know that many of the people in the fan, in, in the stands, had portable radios. And their beloved Milwaukee Brewers were playing... <laughs> the St. Louis Cardinals in game four of the World Series and they were winning (laughs) and they were roaring to the score. You see, here's the point. (laughs) They were listening to something different than what was actually going on on the field. (laughs) That's a great spiritual lesson here. I know what it looks like on the field. I know it looks like death has won. I know it's Friday. I know that it's Friday, and it looks like, like the devil has won and that Messiah has been killed. But, but, but we know the outcome. Because why? We're listening and hearing a different story. The story of heaven. The story of God. And that's why it's important that you and I listen to what God is saying regardless of what our circumstances and our feelings are trying to dictate to us. Come on now. This... This is where you take the scripture that says, 2 Corinthians 5, so we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, as well pleased, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Here's the question. Are you responding to what you see or what God says. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You must determine today to move your eyes off your circumstances as a person of faith and open your ears to God's voice. Yesterday morning I had been asked to uh, do a 5K at Run the Parkway with a, a, a gentleman who is working to get in shape and really making a commitment to turn his life around physically. And he says, will you run with me in my second 5K ever? And I said, sure, I'll do it for you. And so I got up and we were going to meet at a, a, a certain place to carpool there. And the whole way there, I just put on my Bible app and I let the Word of God it, read to me. The Word of God read to me. <laughs> it's amazing. Someone recorded it on electronically, and you can have it read to you in different versions, actually. It's called the Bible app. It's, it's you version. It's wonderful. And so the whole way there, for like 15 minutes, had it the book of Philippians, just letting the Word of God wash over me, wash over my mind, wash over my soul, wash over my spirit. And it was amazing. Because why? Why did I do that? Because faith comes by hearing. And by hearing the word of God, I need, to, I need to feed what I want to grow. I need to feed what I want to grow. And, and, and so the opposite is true. Hey, I heard you guys were there. And you ran a half marathon. The Twin Towers. Stand up. Let them see you. All right? The Twin Towers. These two guys. Right here. The Twin Towers. Uh, I call them my Twin Towers. And they, they're on our worship team. Now, I also heard you ran a half. And how old are you guys? 24. And what was your time? Two hours and what? Three? Two hours and three. My brother and I, at about 53, ran it in 157. So, uh, <laughs> just saying, bro. Guys, at 24, I think you can do better. See, here, here's the deal, brothers. Where you are... It's not your destiny. <laughs> Come on. Come on. <laughs> I, man, you happen to be on the front row. It just worked out perfect. <laughs> it's purpose, destiny, timing of God. <laughs> All right. You got to believe. You got to feed your faith. And here's, here's the deal. If you... If you if you don't want to be a gossiper, then you've got to starve the gossip. 
If you don't want to be an unforgiving Christian, then you've got to starve the unforgiveness. Stop feeding what you don't want to grow. And start feeding what you want to grow. Point number three. Believe what God says is true. Not only do you have to understand that where you are is not where you need to be. It's not your final destination. You, and you got to keep climbing. Not only do you have to hear what God says, you've got to believe what God says. you got to mix that word with faith. And then you got to act upon it. It's not enough just to hear the word. You all know that, right? I mean, it's like you're not safe just because you heard a word. It doesn't do, it doesn't profit your world any. Just because you heard a word. You got to act on that word. You got to believe what it says and put it into action. You have to believe what God says is true. Believe what God says, not what you feel or what your circumstances dictate. I love this story from the book. In, 19, in 1886, Walter George broke the one mile record when he ran it in four minutes, 12.75 seconds. It lasted for over 30 years. For over 30 years, that record lasted. Then in 1923, a Finnish runner named Pavo Nurmi ran it in 4 minutes, 10.4 seconds. It remained unbroken for 8 years. And then slowly over time, it kept getting broken uh, by seconds, just by fractions of a second until... Uh, and in fact, it, it got to the point where doctors even... and believe that it was going to be physically impossible for anyone to break the four minute mile. It's just like anatomically, uh, it just wasn't going to happen. But guess what? There was a man named Roger Bannister who didn't believe the myth. He, he didn't believe the lie. <laughs> he didn't believe the speculation. And in 1954, Roger Bannister broke the four-minute barrier with three minutes, 59.4 seconds. And we all know the story after that. Once that record got broken, then everyone believed they could break it. They had to run it. And that's what started happening. When you make up your mind that you're, going, you're not going to quit, that is when the battle really is won. When you make up your mind you're not going to quit, that's when the battle is really won. You've heard me preach from this series that it's not about trying. I, I get sick and tired of people saying, I'm trying, I'm trying. That's nothing but an excuse. That's nothing but an excuse. Like, no, I'm not trying. I'm not trying. I am doing this. My wife and I aren't trying to not have... Uh, certain things in our life. No, we, we're just like, we've meant this is not in our life. Like, we don't get boyfriends and girlfriends on the side. We're not trying not to. We've made up our mind. This isn't happening. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You don't struggle with what you've made up your mind about. It's like, this isn't for me. It's not God's will for me. It's not like, I'm trying. Like, I'm not trying to raise 300 pounds. Like, you know, it's, I'm not trying. You know why I'm not trying? Because I haven't even trained to try. It's like, and, and I'm not going to try. Because I, there's, I haven't prepared for it. It's like stupid. But I can train and do 100, 150, maybe get 180, maybe work my way up to 200. Two and a quarter? I don't know. But, but I'm not trying to do that. I'm training to do it. And there's a huge difference. I'm training to do this. I'm not trying. When my brother took the challenge to run his first half marathon, you know what he set out to do? Not to run a half marathon. You know what he set out to do the first day? I want to run a quarter of a mile without stopping. That was what he set out to do. Because why? He wasn't going to try to run one in a day. He was going to train to run one in 12 weeks or whatever it was. 
So tomorrow morning, you're either going to get up and come to prayer or you're not. But there's no try to it. Because you know how to get up. And you know how to get to the airport when you're going away on vacation. And you know how to get to work because there's no trying. You do it. Oh, come on now. So just whatever you allowed yourself to excuse out of your life because you tried. Call it what it is. Big fat excuse. A lie. And that's what an excuse is. Stuffed in the skin of reason. And any way you slice it, it comes up baloney. <laughs> Stand with me if you would, please. Some last points. You cannot live in the past. The call is upward. Keep climbing. Quit living in the past the way it used to be. Well, it used to be this way. We used to sing these songs, and we used to do this, and we used to do that, and we used to have this, and we used to have that. Well, listen, you're not 20 anymore, and you don't do back the backflips. If you do, you're going to end up with a broken back or something worse, right? It's what we used to do, the past, the past. Well, this, 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 this it's now. Daniel, it's now. Are you going to deal with now? Because that's all you've got going forward. You can forgive people in your past. You can forgive yourself from the things in the past. You can tell regret goodbye. You can tell shame goodbye because the new you is going to face the new you and the new future that's for you. You've got a decision to make if you're going to keep climbing. And here's something. Just, let's just say these out loud together by the grace of God. Let's just do these. Let's put them up there. I cannot. I, I am never going to quit loving. I'm never going to quit serving. I'm never going to quit forgiving. I'm never going to quit praying. I'm never going to quit believing. I'm never going to quit being kind. Come on, you can just keep filling it in. Why? Because the God who's loving me like he's never been hurt is going to love through me like I've never been hurt. That's how I can say that. That's how I can say that. And one last thing before I close. Will you do me a favor and challenge every mean Christian you come in contact with to stop representing God that way? Will you please do that? And if you're one of those mean Christians, will you please stop? You can be mad. You can be hurt. You can be angry firm but you don't have to be mean <laughs> you know I mean mean you don't have to be mean because when you're mean you're not loving like you've never been hurt love is patient love is kind love is long suffering love is forgiving bow your heads with me possible that you're here today and you say, Pastor Philip, first things first, I need to surrender my life to God. I've kind of got one foot in, one foot out. I kind of like the benefits of God, but I don't necessarily really want God in my life, and I'm convicted about that. And today, I want to settle accounts with God, and I want to make my peace with God, and I want to surrender my life completely to Him. And if that's you, just lift your hand. Anyone here this morning who said, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life? see your hand, sir. Anyone else? Just don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. It's between you and God. No man can come to the Father unless the Holy Spirit draws him. Pray this with me out loud together. Let's all join in in a confession of faith. Dear Jesus, I'm in need of you. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. From this moment on, I surrender my life completely to you. Come live in me by the power of the Holy Spirit and change me from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we give God a big hand for his goodness? Can we give God praise and honor?
to give him glory. If you prayed that prayer with me for the first time or maybe rededicating your life to God, that's a powerful thing. We have a book we'd love to put in your hand called Fresh Start. If you don't get one, you can come by new here and my wife and I would be glad to give you one. The Bible says to as many as received him, he gave the right to become a child of God. And that's a work and a miracle of God and we, we rejoice. How many of you are going to let this not just be a series, but you want it to be a lifestyle of letting the God who loves you like you've never been hurt, love through you like you've never been hurt. That's my prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, let this word and let this truth, God, that we've heard these last six weeks truly, truly come to each of our hearts and our lives. And let us yield to your love, God, like you've never been hurt so that we can go love like we've never been hurt. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give God a big hand for his goodness, will you? Amen. What a, I, have you loved this series? It's so practical. I, I think it's going to be one of those books I'm going to be holding on to for a very long time and just going back and reading. It's been so, so good. Hey, just a couple of things real quick before we're dismissed. Um, if you uh, want to pick up a yard sign, you can do that at the Welcome Center. Again, you do have to have a yard. Um, also, um, if you have not signed up for what service you're attending for Easter weekend, it, it would really help us tremendously if you would do that for us. You can do that as you leave. Um, there are iPads out there that you can sign up. If you have the freedom to lift your hand, I'd like to pronounce a blessing over you, church. I bless you to love God. I bless you to love the people in your world. I bless you to serve your world and to live a generous life to the glory of God. Amen. Have a fantastic week. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 530.